why don't you tell us who you are and a little bit of your backstory and then lead into how you came to be interested in running for office. My name is Tesha Buss. I come from a very small town in Illinois. I grew up on a fourth generation family farm and our farm went under. My parents bought a bar and restaurant. So I watched them lose everything. Our house, our farm, pretty much everything went into a van and went into my new house, which was above this bar. I watched them work 70, 80 hours a week, trying to recover from that. And that's when I started my work in the service industry. I worked for a little diner next door called The Dinner Pail. Before that, it was called The Feed Bag. So you're talking real small town, 500 people. I wanted to be a Broadway dancer, which everyone thought was insane coming from the middle of nowhere in Illinois. But I went to college for dancing and uh, made it onto the Broadway stage when I was 24. I auditioned for Cats for over seven years, um, at least nine auditions, and finally made my childhood dream come true. So I came to Vermont to work at the Westin Playhouse. Uh, I did seven summers there as a choreographer and decided to open my business in Vermont called Good Commons. It's a yoga retreat home. So I've been in Plymouth for 16 years as a business owner and lived around and such. When I got pregnant with my daughter in 2014, I called 13 childcare centers and there was no room for her. So I strapped her to me and catered 350 person barbecues and uh, cooked for a lot of people at my place. And when I got her a spot at Rainbow Play School, I immediately joined the board and became active as a public servant in a new way. I'd always been on nonprofit boards before, but this time it had new drive and energy behind it because I didn't want another mom to have to leave the workforce or a dad to have to leave the workforce to take care of their kid. So. We, uh, I helped them buy that 8,000 square foot vacant building and turn it into a childcare center that doubled the number of infant spots in our town. I created a community solar array to offset its energy needs as well as 17 other homes. And then when the, uh, when the pandemic hit, that's when I started the community campus. So. Kids came to the community campus and we guided them through their online learning so that parents could continue to work. And it gave them a place for kids to be kids again. Um, we had 53 kids at the height of the pandemic at my place and I felt that we were doing a great service. So when I was actually asked by a number of people if I would consider running for office because I've had my hands in a lot of different pots and I thought, this is my time. This is my time to serve in a new way. I didn't have a, a project on the horizon, and I always love a project. So now I hope to represent Windsor Five. And is it safe to assume that childcare would be uh, one of your main focuses if you're elected? Absolutely. I have a lot of uh, so I, I licensed two centers. I assisted Rainbow in getting licensed at the new building. Even though Rainbow had been open for 38 years, you still have to obtain a brand new license with a new space. So with that came an unbelievable amount of paperwork, both from the getting the building prepared in terms of public safety and then licensing, how the rooms have to be set up and... Um, the rest of the things made sense, but the rooms getting set up was, I think, their biggest concern. Um, there's just a lot of square footage measurements that you have to do, but um, the timeline of, of how everything falls together. Then when we licensed the community campus, it was way more flexible. They allowed us to take a, a, a six-month process and shrink it down into about five weeks. Um, it was also helpful because they knew that they knew me. I had just been through it with Rainbow. So. Uh, I could just call them up and say, okay, here's the checklist. If I hit everything so that we're ready? And we're like, yes, we're going to go. And, uh, and they actually did our walkthroughs on Zoom because they couldn't come into our spaces. 
So it's a very different experience, but from that, I've learned a lot. And then working with the community campus um, on the ground, I always say as a, as a boss, when someone comes to me as an employee and they ask, I'd like to make something better, can I do that? Sometimes you just gotta go into the belly of their day and see it with, through their eyes and walk in their shoes. And then it tends to make sense. So I'm hoping that that's the kind of energy and knowledge I can bring to the state house to make changes that can help childcare tomorrow. Um, there's a lot of small things that would really make a big difference in the average day of a child care worker. Um, and what are some other what are some other issues that that you feel that your experience uh, would lend itself well to? So in 2014, I was approached by Sovereign Solar because they wanted to have a community solar array on the Ludlow Electric Grid, and I own a parcel of land and it's pretty close to the road, about 500 feet. And so I began exploring community solar. Also for my business, which is on the Green Mountain Power Grid. So I first bought into community solar um, on Green Mountain Power. At the same time, we were investigating whether or not my land was going to be appropriate for Ludlow Electric. And through that process, I learned so much. I went to NeighborWorks of Western Vermont and retrofit insulated my, my business and my home at the time, and then um, got community solar. So my business is net zero in Plymouth. And that was, it's been challenging because it's a 4,700 square foot, 18 room retreat home. So I couldn't do heat pump technology throughout the whole house. I had to use different systems. And I had to go through different loan systems for my home and through my business. So there's different tax credits and depreciation that you can look at as a business owner versus uh, my home, which is just me as a regular Vermonter. So I like the fact that I have those two different perspectives to bring. And there are a lot of benefits to that net zero technology. Um, for instance, my dad would text me all the time, Tisha, gas has gone up to, you know, that's $5 a gallon, this is crazy. And I'd say, well, this is where our electricity is regulated. So my, my car's gas, my electric vehicle, I didn't, I didn't experience the swing. So it would be amazing to get so many more Vermonters on, off of the swing of oil in the open market into a regulated utility. So I feel that that's a, a very passionate thing for me to help our workforce. And it satisfies, it's a win-win because it satisfies our climate goals as well. I permitted the solar field at Rainbow Play School, and that is a very intense process um, to review the amount of endangered species of birds and plants and other animals and the amount of testimony that has to go into permitting an array. It's an extraordinary undertaking and people are working with the system. They're getting through it. When the, when the Public Utility Commission first put out that an array over 15 kilowatts was going to require this level of permitting, it almost, it seemed at first, was going to derail solar completely. It is not done so. People have rolled up their sleeves and realized that once you learn the process, you can repeat the process more gracefully. But I think we're going to have to make some adjustments when we move forward with more people doing heat pump technology and using electric vehicles because 15 kilowatts isn't going to cut it for most of us, particularly if that community solar array retains the recs and doesn't sell them. So we, uh, I'd like to put my, uh, my hand in that pot as well uh, from that experience. And I'm very passionate about our environment and I'm very passionate about our workforce. Do you think that Vermont is doing enough to meet our climate goals? And what do you say to those people who, who feel that these efforts are going to end up costing Vermonters more in the short term? So 
Green Mountain Power with the utility uh, package of using the Tesla battery backups in all the homes, there was a figure that was put out this summer, and I apologize that I do not have it off the top of my head, but it was an extraordinary figure that Vermonters were saved by this program because we didn't have to buy power uh, with a high demand fee because GMP dipped into those batteries on a hot July day so that we didn't have to have those demand charges. And I've seen businesses in Ludlow, well, one of them is on my solar array, their demand fees could be, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per month. So that program alone, to me, saves Vermonters a lot of money. A solar panel is extremely recyclable. It's largely, you know, metal and glass and some wires. You can teach kids how to make solar panels. So I think that's important to remember as well. Um, when we look at how it saves Vermonters on a month-to-month -month basis, you know, an average solar panel operates at 80% at the end of the 25th year. That's a long time, uh, way past the amount of payback. Even without the extra money, this, the adder, you used to get extra money for every kilowatt hour that you generated. So if power was sold at 15 cents, you got 19 cents. Well, a lot of Vermonters were frustrated by that, and I can absolutely see where they're coming from. Now they've removed that, so they're no longer, more people aren't paying for that level of solar. But it is making our grid more consistent and more flexible. And one thing I learned from my parents losing their farm was diversification. You have to diversify all of your investments and move things out into a bunch of different ways. And I think that's what renewables really help our grid. It makes it uh, more relaxed and flexible. And the other thing that I do want to say is I hear so much about Vermonters being concerned that our grid isn't strong enough to handle our electric vehicles. And most of those folks that haven't owned an electric vehicle to know that there's a program to incentivize us to charge at night so that we don't, I plug in my car, but my car won't start charging until after 9 p.m. So my cars and everybody else's car can charge when we don't have a huge draw on our grid. And then that is a further diversification of our resources. So I think Vermont is doing a lot. Can we do more? Absolutely. And I think the legislature also came to realize that we had these great goals, but nobody was monitoring whether or not we were all hitting them. And now that is more on the forefront. Everybody wants to know where we are in meeting them. You know, I went to visit, uh, so there's a farmer here in Vermont. He's out uh, just north of Brandon, and he came to Illinois to, to deer hunt. My, uh, where I come from is the white-tailed deer population is so extraordinary that all the people that I know that hunt do not hunt anymore with a gun because it's too easy. They have to, they do bow and arrow or nothing at all. And they're the folks that if you want to hire a tracker, you, uh, two of my high school friends, you would hire them. They take you out and they show you how to track and, and bow hunt. And so he's sitting in my parents' bar and he's like, oh, I'm a dairy farmer. I was like, well, where are you from? He's like, Vermont. He's like, my daughter lives in Vermont. So we went to visit, visit his dairy farm and it has a, a digester, a manure digester. And so I have been reading a lot about you know, some environmentalists feel that there's certain practices in using them that aren't quite good enough. So we have great digesters out there. Now we just need to hone and refine the systems and help them be more efficient so that they're not putting so much methane in the transfer from where the cows are and getting them to the digester. But that digester in general is great. Using waste, in my opinion, is amazing. So if you are elected, do you have any preferences for what committee you'd like to be on? That is such a hard one. That's what I've been struggling with the most. And a part of me doesn't know, um, because I'm coming in as a freshman if I get elected, uh, all the different players. Um, I, you know, as a business owner, I have eight part-time employees. So 
economic development is really important to me. Um, I think we, ha you know, 78% of Vermonters, I believe, are small business owners. So there are probably other people in the legislature that could contribute just as much as I could, um, potentially in that arena. I've really thought a lot about energy because I do have a lot of experience there, but childcare is such a passion for me. And it is a community that I find is the underdog. And I, I definitely feel very passionate about supporting the underdog. And I, I walked in those shoes and trying to keep a baby quiet during a yoga retreat when I'm working a 14 hour day, that's rough, real rough. And so I definitely take that passion with me. So probably human resources would be my, my first choice and then energy and then economic development as I sit right now, subject to change. How, how are you going about your campaign process, uh, connecting with potential future constituents, uh, introducing yourself? How, how are you finding that process? I really enjoy that process, this process. Becca White uh, took me out for my very first day of going door to door and I haven't been that nervous since I auditioned for a Broadway show. And I would say in my early auditions for a Broadway show, because I eventually got to the point where I didn't have to be so nervous because I practiced auditioning all the time. And this, so this really um, stirred up a lot for me. And I would say by the end of the day, I got so excited because most people are they care about Vermont and they loved seeing a new face. They, they liked that uh, I got a lot of comments about, oh, wow, you're, you're young. Um, and then I also received a lot of, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> um, so that was very interesting. And a lot of people just spoke about their concerns. They, they weren't aggressive. Um, I feel like when we read the newspaper, it just feels like everybody is aggressive when they talk about politics. But I didn't find that uh, on the 900 and something doors I've knocked on so far. Um, I've got about a thousand left to go, um, which is my plan. Um, with I've been going out with Becca White, with Allison Johansson, with Allison Clarkson, and it's much more fun to do it with a buddy. I have done it by myself. Um, and I, I can do it, and it's great, but it's easier for conversation to get sparked when there's, you know, three or more of us standing there at the doorstep. A lot of people are very concerned about their kids. Um, after school programming has really come up a lot, which is what the community campus turned into. Uh, right now, it's the only after school program at, in our district. And most of that is because of workforce. And also, I think parents are really struggling with enough time that they don't have as much to give to sports and the ski program and um, being sitting on the board of an after-school program. It's we're really struggling with, with enough energy to serve all the people that we have right now. So we have to get real smart and real creative and, uh, and real systematic about this so that everyone can get the help that they need. I believe in after school programs so much because I think if you're a kid that is into sports, you get that whole team player thing and you feel a part of a community. And when you feel a part of a community, you're not as likely to do all the things that we don't want kids to do, act out and such, and even though they're going to do that, we hopefully want them to do that in the most positive ways. And I think the after-school program, which goes up into age 13 at TCC, could be that. It could act more as that Saturday night hangout space um, so that kids could really feel a part of that. That's what I loved about TCC during the, the pandemic. We had kids cry because they had to go back to school. They liked 
being there where they could learn in a beanbag and lay out on a rug and have the lights dim and twinkle. And it felt like a home, but it wasn't home. It was, I don't know, it's like their version of Hogwarts or something. Um, that's what I would like for more kids to be able to experience it. There was, there's some real magic there. Have you encountered uh, much criticism about property taxes and the high cost of education? Because I certainly did when I was in office. And, and how, do you, how do you respond to that? Well, Becca White was with me and she definitely acknowledged it and spoke about how we're all very concerned about it and we're all trying to figure out the best way to help more Vermonters. I mean, we definitely have the break for a lower income. And what I really want to know is if we adopt the income-based property tax approach, I want to see how the metrics play out for, for all folks, um, because that's going to be really fascinating. That could be an amazing way to obviously help um, a lot of people who are on the, the lower to middle income scale. But we also don't want people to go fleeing from Vermont because their property taxes are already so much higher than other states. Our low population is a, is, uh, makes it hard for us. We have, to, we have to be more creative. And I'm really excited to get and dig into those spreadsheets and those finances to see how we can help more people. The thing is about education is, yes, it is expensive here, and it's expensive because of our lower population. In Illinois, my dad's always saying it's $3,000 to educate a kid, and it's seventeen dollars or $18,000 to educate a kid here. And I don't know all of the um, nuances of town choice, because I do understand that a lot of kids are are going to private schools with publicly funded, with public funds, which I have a hard time getting on board with. So I really hope to understand that better so that our public dollars can go to public school. And if you want to spend your money privately, you, uh, you have all the freedom to do so. Um, so I'm hoping that those kinds of things will help. Um, you know, as a business owner, I'm constantly finding ways to be more efficient. And efficiency always saves so much money and it saves so much aggravation. And perhaps uh, my lens of, of running businesses could contribute to some positive change as well. Let's talk a little bit about the, the partisan divide in the country. Uh, Vermont seems to be weathering that fairly well. We seem to uh, we seem to be retaining some measure of civility with each other. Um, there certainly are, you know, fringes like extreme fringes on on both sides. But for the most part, we seem to be able to come together and work things out with dialogue. Uh, we have a Republican governor, but large Democratic majorities in the House and Senate. Um, are you at all worried about this this growing this growing uh, rift between Republicans and Democrats um, potentially throwing a wrench into how Vermont conducts politics? I am. I do agree. We have stayed pretty insulated in a lot of ways. I think that what concerns me most is our focus has become very emotional and it really needs to stick to that constitution. Um, as, a, as I've sat on nonprofit boards before and emotional things come up and when it's your child, there's like nothing more emotional than your kid. And if you always go back to the bylaws you strip out your personal story and your emotion. And I think that is the grounding force that I hope that our government can take and that Vermonters can also get behind. Um, that, the fact that Governor Scott had decided, you know, or, or gave the blessing for 
Prop 5, now Article 22, um, to go into our Constitution means so much. You know, never before did I think, wow, we have to specify every single individual liberty. That is an astronomical task, it's an impossible task. But I experienced it here in Vermont in environmental court. I wanted to do weddings in a field. And so I went to get an outdoor recreational use permit. And I didn't want to just do weddings. I said, you know, uh, parties of other types, family reunions. And so my neighbors took me to court for these 15 days a year. And the court said that because wedding wasn't specifically listed as an example of outdoor recreational use, that I needed to go back to town zoning and have zoning list it as a specific example. And I thought to myself, well, this is exactly the same thing that our US Constitution is going through. If we have to list every specific example of what liberty means to us as a human being, wow, that, I don't know where we're gonna go with that. We, we've been, we have brought so much more red tape and, and regulation into our lives and inside our bodies that we've ever had. And my father and my mother were visiting me when, um, when Roe v. Wade was overturned and they're, they're huge Trump supporting Republicans. And I said to them, what my concern is, you guys, is that you don't want regulation, but you just regulated my body. And they put their heads down and they said, we know, we, we actually don't agree with this one, except for when it comes to late term. And I said, I understand that 100%. So I, and, and we spar across the table all the time. They stayed, they, my dad hung up my American flag outside my house. And when we go at it, we ultimately come down to believing the same thing. But the information that we receive about who's doing what to keep that from happening, it's just as bad on both sides. And so how do we get to knowing what's really happening on a day-to-day, -day, what is the real news? And who is a, who's making change in a real way? That is where Vermont, I think, has kept that insulation because we have such a close connection to our legislators to know we don't have to wait for WCAX or VPR to come out, or Vermont Public, excuse me. We can just call up Allison, send her an email, or Charlie, I mean, I, I called them all the time. One of the reasons why they asked me to run was they said, we went back and thought, well, how many people have made change in our community that have asked us for help? They are like, oh, it was Tisha, so let's, let's ask her to run. And I think that is going to help us so much, or I sure do hope it will. So you're running as a Democrat. Running as a Democrat. How would you, how would you define your your politics, are you centrist, progressive, or, or do you even bother to use terms like that? My heart is very far left. I, as a Broadway dancer, um, we did a lot of work for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. In fact, that poster, uh, we raised over $2 million for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS with selling posters and that particular benefit. Um, and my dancing partner died of AIDS. And he was going through um, an, a medication shift and he came up to start the show and we start the show upside down. And I hear, <gasps> I'm like, you're about ready to dance cats. This is harder than any other show out there as a dancer almost. And to watch him struggle with that was really intense for me and to watch us lose him. You know, we had his uh, celebration of life in the theater. He was in the show for 13 years. So I, I was introduced to the gay community in a new way. 
Um, I have a friend that I met after he became a man, but he was a woman and an amazing cellist. And when I saw pictures of him as a woman, I was like, wow, now I totally see why you became a man. Like you make, make sense as a man. So I, I definitely want everyone to have the ability to express themselves and to be who they are and to feel safe in that. I mean, as a bar owner's daughter in a Christian town, I got Bibles put in my locker. My uh, volleyball coach, when I missed a ball, he was like, what's your problem, bus, you drunk? Because my parents owned the bar. I mean, that was little compared to what people are experiencing. And that was so hard for me. So I definitely have the, the heart of the far left. But as a business owner, I have to balance a budget. I have to make sure that um, when a new roof, which just went on Good Commons um, after 16 years, it was, it was earlier than it should have, but I needed a new roof. Several sections flew up. I have to make sure there's enough money there. And also, I see with my employees, so I'm a, you know, I said I, I, I have a lot of part-time employees, and it's great for so many Vermonters. I've got two moms of three kids, and the reason why they love working for me is it's, it's high pay, flexible hours. They can't work a nine to five job because they got to pick up their kids and they got to get them here, there and everywhere. So, but when back in the day, you know, 16 years ago, when I'm paying somebody $15 an hour and I want to raise them to 17, their health insurance as a type one diabetic flew through the roof. And she said, Tisha, you got to take away my pay raise. Like, it's terrible. I can't, I can't make it financially. And I went to Farm and Wilderness to, to my friend Peter, who was the CEO, and I was like, have you experienced this? And he's like, we're in it all the time. That pay gap between $15 an hour and $25 an hour is rough. So we can't just lead from our hearts. We have to make sure that we can pay for this for all of the programs, but we also need to make sure, just like with the climate change, are we meeting our goals? Are the people getting the money that really need the help that they need? You know, I there are people who would come into the community campus not be able to afford it, and, and I'd say, well, you know, we've got to fill out this application. She'd be like, I don't know how to do applications. I, I like, no, 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 I can't do it. And I was like, I'll sit with you if you trust me to look at your your tax return and to know that I will keep your information safe. Do you trust me? She was like, yes, I do. And I had to assist through a lot of parents who they, it, first of all, every government form is very challenging. Um, I find a lot of times our, our state websites or federal websites are the hardest to navigate. And then when you're a person that's going in for that help, it's rough. We have a, a group of people that in, in Woodstock have created something called The Hub. And now when you need help, most of the time, if you need help in childcare, you need help with heating assistance, you need help with food, you need help with your home, uh, with rental assistance sometimes. So now you'll be able to go to one person at that hub and that hub will be able to help you get every single application through. And perhaps this will be an amazing way for us to help as a state. If we can show that this can be done on a local level and be more efficient than each individual system, that could be a great way to save Vermont a ton of money. So I'm really excited to see how that program takes off. Um, I sit on the steering committee as a part of the child care piece with um, just how we sort of looked around and, and filled a need pretty quickly and how we can continue to do that. I really want to help, I want to help people, and I want to make sure that that money gets to exactly where it needs to go. And a lot of times I think it's probably an energy piece, so I'm building an ancillary uh, dwelling unit, an ADU, um, building a garage so that I can have a one bedroom apartment. I'm a block from the high school, middle school, I'm hoping that I can find an educator, um, but obviously I'll, I'll take anybody who needs it. Um, but in that process, I was even asking Paul, who has administered so many different programs in the housing world, but he also has worked as a social worker. And he said, you know, we get 
sometimes these pockets of money and then we have to create a, a, a program to fit it. And because the program's new, of course, it's going to have a bunch of mistakes. You know, gosh, in your first year of business, do you make 50% mistakes, 75% mistakes, you know? So I asked him too, I said, so where, what are the income qualifications? And he goes, there are no income qualifications. And I said, so I can rent a Section 8 price to a millionaire? And he goes, yeah. I was like, oh, well, that's not what it's intended for. And he goes, well, hopefully your millionaire won't want to live above your garage, which is true. But um, the fact of the matter is, is that that was just one of those flaws in a system that had amazing intentions. And, and I, you know, I'm not going to rent to a millionaire and a millionaire is not going to live above there, but I definitely, uh, but the Woodstock housing um, ADU grant did those income specifications. So that's where it saw one flaw and then fixed it on a local level. That's where Vermont's really cool because that communication change uh, uh, channel can be fast so that the change can be uh, right behind it. So even if we make the mistake once, hopefully we won't make it again. Yeah, so it sounds like you, you feel like you're in a position to use your business experience to help streamline government processes to better connect government services and supports to Vermonters. That's my hope and that's my plan. Yeah, one of the things, I've utilized the Small Business Development Center a lot. And I find um, that so many Vermonters don't know about it. Uh, it literally saved me. I mean, my two businesses uh, opened in 2008 in July. We all know what happened in November of 2008. I was having panic attacks. One of them was a transportation business. The only loan I could get was 10% interest. Uh, and I had early payback penalties. I had to live out the entire length of the loan, which now they've changed on so many commercial loans. Thank you. Thank you, government. Um, so I went to them and they said, okay, you've got all these bleeds. And I was like, what are you talking about? And we dialed in that profit and loss sheet and how, how many ways can we save here, here, and here to bring the profit up here, here, and here. Um, you know, I had an unemployment claim and then my unemployment was just for one person when I had three employees. My business skyrocketed really fast to eight employees. Now I'm paying unemployment insurance at a much higher rate for eight employees because that's just how the system works. So I'm hoping, yeah, that that type of focus can, can help because they taught me how to do a cash flow analysis, how to, how to watch the money go up and down when we're seasonal businesses and ski season's amazing and then mud season comes and you still have to pay your mortgage, but nobody's going to come to your place in May. Uh, those those were hard times when I first opened up because I didn't I didn't have the connections yet I wasn't set up there weren't yoga retreat centers to go visit um, there and since then there have been a bunch that have come and gone um, so I I hone my profit and loss sheet every year I study it intensely so that I can figure out how to save money um, I live like my my grandmother, who went through the Depression, who ate hot dogs even at Christmas and at Easter, she just like, couldn't bring herself to eat expensive meat, even though it was our cow and we butchered it. She still wouldn't get herself to do that. Um, that's where I come from. So if I can rub two nickels together and make a quarter, I, I want to do that. As a legislator, you would be often... Uh, in, in positions where you have to vote on some controversial issues um, that maybe are outside of your area of expertise or your experience. Um, one that I'm thinking of in particular is the gun issue, uh, which has been a perennial issue in the legislature. Um, and it, it, it inspires uh, great pa passion on both sides. Uh, in Vermont, we have a long tradition of uh, responsible hunting. Um, but what I found was that oftentimes anytime a gun law was being introduced, there was great suspicion amongst the, the hunters that it was just, it was, it was the camel's nose under the tent, slippery slope to ultimately gun confiscation. Um, 
what are your what are your thoughts on that and what are some common sense regulations that Vermont could pass? So I feel that our our checks and balances keep everybody pretty grounded and I'm hoping that that's the first response to everybody is that uh, we always want government to be fast when we're really passionate about the issue and then we all get really frustrated so we, we get frustrated it's it's not fast and it's not fast for a reason and it's not fast in this way to protect all of the interests we all have to make sure that our constituents understand and and get what what we're trying to do which is to make folks safe you know at the community campus i went through the fire the, the safety drills so we had to do the active shooter training and it was a uh, it was brand new to us so you know we went into the third floor and we told all the kids to go to a certain place and all those kids immediately go into problem solving mode but Tisha, what if the gunman does this? What if they get on a ladder and they can get to that third floor window over there, even though there's not a, you know, there's no roof for them to stand on? Can they get a ladder that's that far up? Well, the answer is, yeah, they could show up with a ladder tall enough. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, hopefully we'd stop them by the time they, they got there. But these kids are so, they're so curious and they also want to solve the problem and they want to make sure that they're safe. And so the amount of questions that you get, it took us an hour and a half to get through the active shooter drill because we really felt like we wanted them to be a part of the solution. And that's where I want to, to turn to my constituents and say, okay, so if you are a gun owner, I want you to be able to, to talk to a group of kids and make guns make sense to them. That's that's I think what we can do. If you can, if, if that's the gun law and the gun law can make sense to kids, then we've really done something. Because I've got plenty of kids that love to hunt. My brother hunted, I opened the freezer as a kid and there was a raccoon in there about, it was a very exciting <laughs> visit to their freezer. Um, I've skinned a deer when I was growing up. Uh, you know, if I fish, I, I'm gonna take the fish the whole way. It is really important for, for kids to understand the whole reason why we hunt. We needed that to live and survive. And now we take for granted because the chicken's in a package. And what does the chicken look like? What is the life cycle? And respecting that life cycle. The respect of our food system and the respect of guns, that comes as a package. And we could really do a lot to have everybody understand you know, this is a really intense story, but my friend who's a tracker in Illinois, his dad taught him about guns by uh, shooting a gun that was way too big at a turtle. And he said, I will never, ever forget that. I will never forget what the power of that one teeny tiny bullet could do to that little tiny life force. And he said, that level of respect I've taken with me my whole life. And I don't think that we are going to show up and explode turtles in front of kids, but understanding hunting and the value of life and watching an animal lose its life is how we create solid gun owners in the future. It's how we look at the respect. So do you think there's any reason for gun owners in Vermont to be suspicious or distrustful of government? I think that Every person that I've met that's running for office or that's in office just wants us to be safe. We can never take away anyone's suspicion. If they're going to be suspicious, they're going to be suspicious. That level of suspicion is inherently positive also because if we don't question, then we don't have a free society. But I hope that because they have such access to their legislators that they'll speak up to us and they'll come have this hard conversation. I, I hope they come to me and I hope I stay grounded and I, I hope that we can all continue talking and talking. If we, the minute we walk away from the table, we've lost.
no matter what side we're on. I ultimately decided to run for making Vermont a, a better place for my eight-year-old so that she doesn't have the same struggles. There will always be struggles, but at least they won't be the same, hopefully. And I'm, I'm hoping that other parents can, can see that and decide to become more active as well in whatever way they can do, baking one cake for a bake sale or showing up at a lacrosse practice or whatever it is. Um, I'm hoping that it inspires level, a level of service that my daughter will want to serve, that her friends understand it. They, they've had such a, a funny conversation about running for office. Well, where's the office? And I'm like, there is no exactly office. Um, so teaching them about this is, it's what a great tool that they get to have a voice too. Um, we struggle with that as parents. We always want to tell them what to do, but they get to have a voice. And so looking at your own family conversations in the same way, where we sit at the table and we don't leave, we don't leave until we figure it out. How can folks in your district learn more about you? Uh, how could they reach you if they have questions as you go about your campaign? So my name is Tesha Bus, and my website is teshabus.com. It's one of the great things about having an unusual name. So that's where you can reach out to me with them by phone, by email, text, um, whatever your method is. Uh, I'm sure that I'll have more meet and greets. I, I've done some already in different towns so that people can uh, find me. I'm usually at the farmer's market on Wednesday afternoons um, with my kid getting Ono oh shaved ice. That's, <laughs> she loves it so much. Um, yes, so any way possible, come find me. Tesha, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, best of luck out on the campaign campaign trail, and uh, maybe after the election, uh, we'll, we'll want to circle back with you and talk to you again. That would be great. Thank you so much for coming to talk to me and for your time.